you have to know when you are using a cliche. And I think half the problem is people are not aware of what's a cliche. So you have to learn how to spot what exactly is a cliche, because I don't know that you should never use cliches, but you have to know what you're dealing with. So Alex, what are you dealing with when you're dealing with a cliche? Yeah, it's almost like you can never avoid all of them in a certain respect. You're dealing with cultural language, I think, of the common images of displaying a concept. And it's a very fine line between using recognized concepts versus using very standard and typical concepts that are not quite original enough. So Deep D, how would you actually define a cliche for people who are not familiar with the term? I guess a cliche is something that has been used as an identifier or a symbol of something so often that it almost makes you want to roll your eyes. It's just an overused identifier. And of course, the root of that is in something probably original, but it's been re reproduced and not really creatively remixed so many times that at this point, it's really not a creative way of addressing an idea. Do you agree, Clara? Yeah, it's something that people look at and say, oh, I've seen that 50,000 times. That's nothing new. And so it's usually something that prevents people from really engaging with your work as an original idea. So the thing about cliches, again, we're not saying don't use them because to a certain degree, you sort of can't avoid it, as you said, Alex. So one option is get rid of it. Don't use the cliche. Why would you want to not use the cliche, Alex? I think nine times out of 10, you'd want to not use the cliche because it lumps your work in with a lot of other work of the same caliber sometimes. Um, like if you're trying to visually explain something and you're using the same exact method and the same exact styles and the same exact composition even, it, it's just like all the rest. As you said, Claire, it's, I've seen it a thousand times. Now here's another option maybe you actually intentionally use the cliche itself and you mess with it. Deepti, what do we mean by mess with it? <laughs> well, I think that with every cliche, that, like I said earlier, there is a route to why it exists and why it represents something. And I think you can always use that basic principle but make it your own. And sometimes you can use a cliche and be aware that it's a cliche and make something kind of tongue in cheek or that's very meta and very aware of the fact that it is a cliche, you know, and that could actually be a really original way of dealing with the cliche. It's like rules are made, but then rules are made to be broken, but you have to do it in a smart way. Now, how do you know if your image is a cliche? Because the thing is not everybody necessarily knows all of these different references. And so I think a big part of working with a cliche or trying to avoid it, whichever one you're trying to do, is learning how to identify it. So my first thought, it's usually the first most obvious idea, the idea that takes no thought at all to come up with. So for example, one thing that I do with students is we play word association. So we just go back and forth and we just say the first thing that comes into our mind. So Alex, if I say the word slow to you, what is the first image that comes to your mind? First image, it's like a turtle um, or like a snail. Deep Deep, what's next? Those were literally my two first images or I guess like crawling maybe. Well, <laughs> if you guys do a Google image search, <laughs> you will see you're going to get a bunch of images of snails. And so this is actually something that I do when I'm trying to come up with an idea. I'll just do a Google image search of the word and just see what pops up. We're getting a really good uh, point from that one person saying, sometimes I think a cliche is easier to relate to for non-art people. But for art people, it can get a little annoying seeing the same thing over and over again. And that one person, I think, you guys, that that hits on uh stock photos in general every time you see like someone in a suit going like ah like with coffee filling every artist in the room rolls their eyes but then like 
your other family members are like, oh my God, I totally get that image. <laughs> so yeah, what do you think about that? That it's this kind of, do you think that cliche images only affect artists or do you think it affects the viewers as well? Hmm. That's, I think it affects the artists and the viewers. I think that it is true that sometimes cliche work is the most relatable. However, I do think that even non-artists can look at cliche work and have that same gut reaction that it is a little cliche because sometimes I think what makes things cliche is that they're so used that they become just like everywhere. You know, you see it everywhere. You don't have to go to a gallery to see something that's cliche. It's everywhere. So I think for a non-art person and an art person, cliches do exist on like the same platform because we're all so used to seeing them. All right, let's try it again. This time the word is identity. Alex, what is some of the first images that comes to your mind? Uh, I think a mirror. Deep, deep. Um, I think a question mark. Yeah. I would say maybe a brain, something like that. So if you guys do a Google image search, Look what pops up. I mean, apparently everybody's head is a jigsaw puzzle when they're thinking about their identity. So this is a great, really simple way just to think quickly about exactly what you're getting yourself into. Now, so here's the thing. We're going to go through a whole bunch of images that are known as cliches. But I do think that cliches come from somewhere. I'm not saying that the whole clock thing necessarily comes from Dolly, but it is a very famous painting that a lot of people associate with clocks. And so, Alex, why do you think that is? Do you think it's just somebody makes something and everybody thinks, oh, that's cool, I'm gonna do it too? Why, why does that happen? Yeah, I think there is something for like the visual, like cultural language and the zeitgeist going around. It also could kind of tap into kind of like our universal as people like shared conscious like in the concepts of images images that will always resound to us um and yeah i think with cases like dolly that it comes in seasons of like everyone getting into art and it's not hard to see this painting by dolly and then think as you're learning it oh i want to make cool art too so you make art that you admire we have a question from Michael who says, can't cliches be used to communicate because everyone knows them, assuming the cliche is not the central point of the artwork. Deepti, why don't you take this one? That's, it, it's true. And I think that's what we mean about how to mess with a cliche or remix it. If you're using it intentionally as a, you know, as a tool or a symbol or a way to communicate something that's maybe hard to grasp or it needs to land really quickly, perhaps a cliche is the best way to go about that. But I think it all comes down to intent. Sometimes I feel like a cliche is the easy way out or the easy way to approach an idea because you've seen it so many times and people will just get it. So you have to think, is this the best way of addressing this idea or this topic or what I'm trying to achieve? Or is it just the first thing that comes to mind and like the cool thing that's in right now. This is a great question. Mm -hmm. Alex, why don't you take this one? Megan B is saying, are emojis cliches? That's such a great question. Um, I would say right off the bat, I think the concept of emojis are cliches. Um, I feel like when I see like a big billboard and it's like, oh no, a mother, another Monday without my coffee emoji. It's like, ah, oh, I, I can't with that anymore. Um, I think boomers are the only ones talking about emojis. Um, but <laughs> I don't think emojis themselves are cliche. I think the concept of them is. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, that's such a cool thought-provoking question though, of when an image becomes cliche. Let's talk about my favorite one, broken mirrors. There's always so many variations of this. And I have to ask, Alex and Deepti, between the two of you, have you guys done your broken mirror self-portrait at some point in your life, Deepti? Do we need to confess? I mean, probably. I can't even remember it, like, a, but I'm not even gonna say no because I'm sure someone will find it and dig it up. Like, I think every single cliche we're gonna address tonight, I have probably dabbled in. Alex? 
Oh yeah, uh, I did a lot. I might have done a broken mirror one for, I, I definitely for a college project, without a doubt. And now I believe it is time for our audience to confess. Tell us in the chat, have you guys ever made a broken mirror artwork? Whether it's a literal broken mirror, which you see here, but I can definitely call out Lauren Welch, who's a teaching artist here, because this was in her art school portfolio. So Alex, why broken mirrors? What's up with this? I think, I mean, it's one of those things where it's not inherently bad. It is a cool concept that can make cool effects and it does spice up the use of just the mirror self-portrait, which I think is why it's easy to latch onto and then you have everyone doing it. So it's one where I can see someone being excited about doing a mirror self-portrait and thinking, ah, you know what, I really want to do this. So I would say don't just throw the idea out the window, but challenge it and be, how can I make this idea new again? Dara is asking, do cliches matter between fine art illustration and commercial art? Deep D, what's your take? That's a hard question, but my gut reaction would be that maybe cliches work a little bit more in commercial work than they do in fine art because sometimes fine art I think is expected sometimes a little bit more to have like deeper meaning and sometimes commercial work it's made for the purpose of a five second reaction from someone. So a cliche might be the best way of addressing something like that. Like Alex, you said the billboard with the coffee emoji, you know, it's it's cliche, but you're driving and you see it and you get it. So I think that sometimes cliches are more accepted in commercial work and maybe illustri illustrative work that's commercially driven rather than um, like fine art work that you see in a gallery. We have a bunch of confessions and people saying they've never done it. Desamba says, typically I see the broken mirror effect associated with broken identity, but it's a cool effect. Mm -hmm. And we have some other people saying like that one person I actually haven't, I've used pieces of a broken mirror on a piece of that counts, but a full broken, any shred of a broken mirror, I think definitely counts. <laughs> By the way, it's not just broken mirrors, it's just mirrors in general. So. Alex, what's the fascination with mirrors? Why does everybody who makes an installation at some point have to have a mirror in it? Like, what's the fuss? I mean, I think as this image shows, they are really cool. <laughs> like the um, the Chicago Bean is, I think, the first image I can think of a big mirrored installation, and they're awesome. I've been told. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so cool to see them. It changes with the time of day. Um, in a gallery, it's a cool setting, and that's. I don't know, I think this is another one of these cliches where I've loved with the broken mirrors, we saw, we had a couple people in the chat that said, oh, that's cool, I wanna try a portrait like that. And it's just because it's a cliche doesn't mean don't do it. It means like be aware that many others have done it. It's also a really easy way to just, or a quick way and accessible way to distort reality, which I think a lot of people mm. are trying to do with Art, you know, as artists, we are trying to reimagine and reinvent reality. So I think putting a mirror in something, you're inevitably distorting it. And you're also, as an artist, turning the art to reflect on the audience member, which are both really cool concepts. It's just the mirror is kind of maybe the easiest way or one of the simplest ways to do that. And so thus, perhaps it's become a bit of a cliche. I think 10,000 Crows pretty much sums it up by saying you can't deny mirrors are kind of magical. I know, like you can have the most boring mirror on the planet and it is sort of like magic. And so I feel like for a lot of people, a mirror, it just becomes sort of a cheap trick. I mean, I have seen them used well, but a lot of the times I see people using them because they can't come up with anything else and the mirror sort of bails them out in a way. So it's a very common thing that I see. All right, Alex, did you draw some eyes at some point? A bunch, a bunch, especially like, oh, what if there was like, I saw like Pan's Labyrinth, which is a great movie. And then all of a sudden I was doing sketches of eyes on people's hands. Who knew? <laughs> like, yeah, I eyes all the time in middle school and high school. Deep D, how about you? I mean, they are the windows to our soul, Clara. <laughs> How can you avoid? I mean, of course I have. Who hasn't obsessed over eyes and 
it makes sense. I mean, eye contact is huge in, you know, human to human relationships and comfort and stuff. So it is an area of focus in our daily life. So yeah, it'll translate into art quite commonly, I think. I get it. I mean, eyes are extremely powerful in terms of communication. I mean, if you think about when you meet somebody for the first time, usually the eye contact is very important. But see, it's not just a single eye. It's always like some illustration with eyeballs staring at people. And I, I don't know what, what the deal is. It's just like it never ends with mm -hmm. eyes. And so, Alex, are we saying never paint eyes? I mean, what are we saying? Because I am sort of rolling my eyes at a lot of this work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I don't think we're saying never do eyes. And like DP was saying earlier with like the uses of editorial illustration, you need a concept to convey, conveyed quickly. And a lot of the times the concept of the editorial, the writing is very complex. So it's like, hey, we need to represent the doctor get your white lab coats, that's what we're doing. <laughs> it's the same thing with eyes watching. And I think that that's when you have to know as a creative, all right, I'm working with the cliche. I have to rely heavily on color and composition to make this piece more interesting and exciting. This is an interesting comment from Maria who says, the first thing I learned to draw quote realistically, I think it's the first thing a lot of people focus on while learning. Absolutely. That's really common. Why do you think that is, Deep D? Why an eye? I don't know. I'm actually just thinking about in middle school, I would just draw eyes in my sketchbook repeatedly. I think it's probably because when we're drawing faces as kids, the eyes are a really important part. You know, you don't put that much focus on a nose. It's kind of like that mouth is like that, but the eye you put focus on because that's how you create human connection. So, you know, and a really intense eye can actually say a lot. These eyes that we're seeing, yes, they're cliche, but they are maybe descriptive and they are intriguing. So um, it, can, it can pull out a lot of emotion, the eyes. So I think that's why we're drawn to them. So Tainley says, I would think cliches would be fine for a student if it is to acquire the skill to draw an eye or mirror. What do you think about that, Alex? I completely agree with it. Um, yeah, like some of the things we're talking about, I haven't done a self-portrait in a while, and it's been even longer since I've done a broken glass mirror self-portrait. <laughs> so like I might end up doing one of those to practice uh, later in the future. Um, I think that's, that's the thing is to not... If you see the cliche, not necessarily like shame it, because I, that's a really good drawing of an eye, Mazel Tov. Um, but also like don't keep yourself from using them, you know? I think just view them more critically. Yeah, and I think that there's a difference between just sketching an eye for fun or for exercise or because you wanna get better at drawing them. I mean, Jordan and I did this whole stream where he and I just drew eyes just to exercise. And that's different than if you're trying to make a full out artwork. And then other people just wanna study the anatomy of the eye to make their portraits more convincing. So I think that there are places and times where it's like, yeah, it's fine, just draw eyes forever and ever. It's just, you have to realize if you're gonna make a more complete artwork that at some point, you're gonna have to move on to something more creative. So Deep Deep, what's up with the butterflies and birds? Please, please explain, because this is the one I don't get this one. Like the other ones I sort of understand, but not this one. It's freedom. It's humans can't fly. So we personify ourselves into these beings that can fly and butterflies are also beautiful. So we can be beautiful and we can fly and then birds just fly. And I mean, it's common things that we interact with, but we can't necessarily empathize with on the flying thing and the flying is freedom. So that's my take on it. Alex thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I just, I have to quote Dr. Lecter, just like the butterfly is change from caterpillar to, <laughs> you know, it's I, yeah. Freedom change transformation. Yeah. We have a comment from Sonnet who says, is the trick to take the cliche and present it in a new and innovative way, or is it cliche to say that? Mm -hmm. Deep D, what do you think? 
I think that can be the trick. I mean, I, I think all of us on this stream aren't really wizards at what to do with cliches. Um, but I do think that reinventing it and presenting it in a new innovative idea, or like I said earlier, really having an intention for why you're using the cliche is, is the way to go. Um, but it also may be cliche to say that. I don't know. Cliches are so hard because for some people, I was just thinking about how like these are all cliches to us, but maybe someone from a different part of the world or who isn't as exposed wouldn't really consider this cliche. So it can be kind of subjective too, what, what is cliche and what isn't. Um, so just, you know, do your thing. <laughs> 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 this comment is from Seven Angelic, who says, I guess the thing about cliches are that they recur because they have so much mass appeal. It's an easy image that strikes everyone. Yep. And sometimes artwork needs that quick read. Sometimes you're in a context where there's no time for somebody to stare at the painting for six hours to understand it. And you do want a quick read. But again, it, it does get boring after a little while. All right, Alex, screaming faces. I think I'm the queen of the screaming face, but I'm sure you've done one at one point, right, Alex? Uh, what's funny is I was a little late in the game on the screaming face because I had the reverse problem. I couldn't draw expression on faces for decades. <laughs> so once, yeah, it took me a long time to get the cliche of a screaming face. Well, I can say that Edvard Munch definitely contributed to this. And I would also say Francis Bacon, who was inspired by this 1926 film, The Battleship Potemkin, which I'm sorry to say I have never seen, but this is a super famous film still on the right-hand side, which actually influenced Francis Bacon in his paintings later on. So Deep D, we're looking at a lot of examples here, okay? We have Munch, we have Battleship Potemkin, and we also have Francis Bacon amongst others. What is it about this <laughs> that everybody needs to do? It's interesting because I've definitely drawn a screaming face. And I think what intrigues me about a screaming face is maybe the way that our uh, faces squish and stretch and the folds and stuff. But I think with these, what's intriguing is the lack of information, actually. But this really guttural, intense, human reaction that's happening and it's a really interesting way to and quick way to draw people in and have them have a lot of questions but you know it's interesting for monk but then we do it a million times and it's like do we care anymore i don't know so moses is calling me out Professor Liu is guilty of this in there. Oh, there is a lot of evidence. There's all 50 portraits if you want to reference them. But, you know, I think what bothers me about the screaming face cliche is oftentimes there's no real story behind it other than I feel angst. And that's it. Like, it's so much about skimming the surface. There's nothing wrong with the screaming face. I just feel like a lot of times people don't get deeper than that skimming the surface type of thing. I don't know, Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. And it's funny where it's really important to note that we're bringing up famous and really lauded pieces of work to bring up cliches. Um, as an example of none of these are bad tools that you should avoid using. Um, but just know that it's a very common tool. Uh, there was a really astute way to look at it um, from Hellish D art saying, I think they're the same things most people start drawing. So when a beginner artist checks out Instagram, for example, they see other artists drawing these things, so they draw them too, uh, where it's essentially always used as a learning tool and a form of flattery of work that you admire. Um, so it's not inherently bad that it's produced by many people but something to be aware of. Well, I think oftentimes with cliches too, they're not very well researched. I feel like a lot of people are very quick to latch on to cliches because they are quickly understood, but, and people can definitely argue with me on this. I think that artwork has to go deeper than that. Like why a scream? Like if you ask people who are making screaming face images, you say, well, why are you making this? 
I don't know that a lot of people have a very substantial answer to that. I could be totally wrong. I just think it's an image that packs a punch. Like, how can you look at an image of somebody screaming and not be moved by it? It's such a intense face, I suppose, is the way to put it. Deepi, where do these long winding roads come from? <laughs> Um, I mean, it has a lot of Wizard of Oz connotations to me, um, but who knows where they come from? I've never seen a winding road like that in real life. Have you, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I want to go to there. <laughs> <laughs> so why? Because, I mean, I'm in Utah right now where there's a lot of dirt roads all over the place. There's nothing even close to this. I'm sure there are some out there that exist. But why is it always long and windy and full of colors? Is this like Wizard of Oz thing? Yeah, I feel like it's, again, that shared subconscious thing of like the journey, life's journey, the path, the travel, wandering. So it's it's maybe that's a feature of cliche too, is that it not just is seen by many different people, but that it resonates with many different people. That it doesn't almost anyone who sees a road gets all of those, excuse me, all of those concepts of travel and journey. Maybe it's just a journey thing because you know, there's so many books about this character goes on a journey and discovers themselves. And the road is just a really quick way to show that without having to do a lot of explanation. All right. I'm sorry, guys. This is relevant. I trust, I've been watching Lele Biz a lot this last week. I do write things just so cute. I just love him. Anyway, there is this song in Lele Miz. <laughs> he cries a lot in this movie. And it's called Empty Chairs and Empty Tables. Tell me if you've seen this movie. I actually really don't like this movie. It's like really badly made, but Eddie wrote it's really cute. So anyway, Empty Chairs and Empty Tables. And there's a scene where he's like moaning about all his friends are all gone and they were all murdered and he's all alone and so oftentimes you get this like big interior space with like a single chair to show loneliness and isolation deep deep what is the chair thing all about i don't know i mean <laughs> i mean yeah like it, it reads as lonely and it reads as absence and it reads as a lack of something. And I think it is a good way to show absence. I think it is an interesting way, but at this point it's done so much that, you know, what more could you show perhaps through this absence? I mean, this piece that we're seeing is kind of interesting. There's a jacket on the chair. So perhaps that gives us a little bit more information as to who we are supposed to be missing or feeling the absence of. I think the the empty chair is a little bit less of a cliche for me. Maybe that's my exposure. But I do think that just an empty chair is like, okay, cool, we get it. But adding some elements to spice it up and give us a little bit more of a narrative and an intent could, uh, you know, like we've talked about before, take a cliche and remix it and make it innovative and interesting. W315 says... a. I think a chair stands in for a person. So do you think that's what it is, Alex, that people are trying to suggest a person's presence but not have the person there? Is that what they're trying to do? Yeah, maybe like the first image of this is a cliche I can think of is that uh, they make so many X-Men movies and none of them have been good yet. But when <laughs> something happens to Charles Xavier, no spoilers, um, and then it's a shot of like the wheelchair and it's just empty. So I think that, yeah, that can be a concept of that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that like, oh, it just looks like a lovely still life. And I'm like, yeah, honestly, that's I think my first takeaway when I see them. Although Megan B <laughs> makes a good point when you don't have money to pay for a model. Exactly. <laughs> Artist problems, right? All right, Deep D, where does this one come from? The black and white image that has a little touch of red in it. Well, the first time I ever saw it was in this film, Schindler's List. Um, and I think it, again, kind of like the scream, it packs a punch in a really direct way because you're, you know, living in this muted color palette. And then you have red, which is one of the like most intense 
emotional colors just thrown at you. So your eye inevitably will follow it and will care about it. So I think that's where it comes from. Alex, thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's the kind of thing where it works. There's that graphic design phrase my old roommate would say a lot where it's like, if you can make it big, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it red. And these things just kind of punch and stand out. Um, and so it's no wonder why there are so many images like this because it works. Like no matter how good or bad the image is, you're like, oh, wow, look at that red against black and white. <laughs> just draws your eye. Why do you guys think it's red? Like deep D, why not blue or purple? What is it about red? Is it a blood thing? I think it's a blood thing. I think it red makes you think of your heart, which is your emotion. And I mean, if you tell if you ask me what like a really intense color is, I think of red, probably because of blood and heart and anger. It's all very strong emotions associated with it or ideas. Valerie is noticing that the Art Prof logo is black, white, and red. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, <it's, laughs> I mean, it's that thing where it is, it has that power and prevalence. Mm -hmm. Well, just take a wild guess what my favorite color is. It's not an accident <laughs> that that is a red blot and not a cerulean blue one, which probably that's what it would have been if you made the logo, right, Alex? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Big splotch of cerulean blue. For sure. Okay, text. Now, we don't mean just any text. I think it's a very particular use of text where images get labeled as symbols. I don't know if I'm describing this that well, but like Alex, how would you explain the way the text is used here? I think that text when used poorly um, or when used in the term of it being a cliche, I see that as when the text is doing the work that the illustration or the image should be doing. That's the best way I can think to describe it. And Dee, Dee why is the text always on the mouth? Oh, because we are silenced and the text is speaking for us, obviously. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I think, well, because text is translated into speech and you, these people can't say what they're feeling apparently. So it's being written out for them. But I think that's where the issue lies is that, you know, perhaps if you did some thumbnail sketches and spent some more time planning, perhaps there is a way to show this without needing to put it right on their faces. I mean, I guess my problem with the use of the text here is that people are relying on the text to do all the work. Because like, just picture this image, okay? If we take all the text away, we have no idea what the image is. We're like, oh, it's a bunch of kids in a hallway at school. We have no idea that it's about all these different labels that are being put on these people. And so this is why text is really hard to use because I think it often is used to sort of bail out the artist. Like people rely on it to explain their artwork. And I think that a strong illustration shouldn't be doing that. I think a strong illustration should do that on its own, but it's hard. Wouldn't you say, Alex? Oh yeah, like it's, it, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Um, where this <laughs> is like that step one, like first thumbnail, like I have an idea, ta-da. Like it's like not, like even if you have the words written on like a name tag, that's a step further, you know? But if you incorporate like different color elements and different composition elements to focus on different attributes that are hidden within these people, then yeah, that's a lot harder to do. And it's a lot harder to convey that, but it's so much more rewarding when the viewer and the artist get to that conclusion. All right, fantasy art tropes. For some reason, it's always some muscly guy with gigantic pecs a practically naked woman who's wearing some skimpy bikini metal thing. And she's always not as high as he is. You guys ever notice this? Like she's never at the same level height wise. Mm -hmm. Deep where does this come from? 
Um, I the artist psyche. I don't know. I I think that in the fantasy realm, I think things that are sexy and things that are um, when it comes to the human body, things that are jarring and very appealing to the eye in a in a basic, very stereotypical way, as we see on the screen right now, is a trope in fantasy. And I think cliches and tropes have overlap. Um, and I think this genre is is very you know, they, they do that a lot. And I don't know too much about fantasy. Maybe Alex, you do, but we did do a crit clash on Frank Brazetta's work, um, Jordan and I. And through that process, I learned that this is a very common trope. We have a question from Dara who says, didn't Star Wars start that trope? No, actually, and Cerulean's bringing up Princess Leia. You know that silly bikini thing she's wearing in Return of the Jedi? If you don't know, look it up. But I mean, Frank Frazetta was around before Star Wars, right, Alex? I feel like Star Wars took it from Frank Frazetta, although I could be totally wrong. Maybe you know, Alex. It's one of those, my brain right now is like SpongeBob and all of his filing cabinets, like everything's on fire. Cause I'm like, was Frank Frazetta, was that in the fifties or the sixties or the seventies? <laughs> 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 Definitely in one of those. <laughs> um, but it's funny. I think this is one of those cool cliches to see revamped with a comical, like, intentional jab today. Like, how often do you see, like, a comedy movie with, like, Adam Sandler, like, standing up heroically, like, holding up a spatula in the new Adam Sandler comedy where he's a cook, you know? Uh, so it's funny how this trope is kind of being turned on its head from macho macho to like making fun of that kind of vibe. Yeah. All right. This is my favorite one, guys. Paint that has been poured, splattered, or is dripping. Why do people like this so much? It's like people cannot get enough of this dripping paint. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh my God. I don't know, Clara. Um <laughs> I think I think it's a way to use a material in a very quick, simple way that creates an interesting visual impact, but it doesn't have a lot of thought put into it. It's just kind of like, it's cool, you know? And in my opinion, that's kind of fine if you just want to make cool looking art. But if you're looking to create something with a little bit more meaning, perhaps not. But I don't know. Alex, why do you think everyone's pouring paint everywhere? I, I think you nailed it. It looks cool. Like, it looks really cool. <laughs> the first time I saw pouring paint, it was an Instagram video of a cube, and they kept pouring and pouring, and it pooled all over with, like, a rainbow color, and I was like, that's the best. <laughs> like, I should stop making art. That's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like, because it is cool, um, but it is also, I mean, let's, I couldn't draw a name from a crowd of poured paint artists, so it's yeah, that thing of if you recognize your goal is to make something look cool, that you did it. Um, but that's, it's not going to have a deeper meaning or concept. So you shouldn't hope to invoke one with it or challenge us and see if you can. Well, Megan B makes a good point. It's the ASMR of the visual world. And we have some people confessing, Lisa H. Okay, I love dripping paint. And I do like this comment from Monk who says it's easy and it's hard to mess up. Exactly. Like, how, how can you mess this up? There's just no chance that that's going to happen. And this is interesting. Karen says it does create movement. And I liked it until I saw too much of it. Yeah. And that's where you start to roll your eyes because you're like, okay, they're pouring the paint again. My feeling is that this is just eye candy. It's pretty. It's nice colors. It's glittery. I mean, it's fun, but not much more than that. So Deep Deep, being the animator on the team, can you talk about these images where people repeat something in order to show movement? Yeah, I mean, it's the basic concept of animation is what we're seeing on screen right now. It's every frame of a movement, you know, my hand going like this, it would be like, bow, 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 put next to each other. So we have movement in one single image. And I actually love the Moybridge zoetropes because that's a really old and really cool way of learning how to animate and breaking down film, which is essentially what you're seeing on the screen is every single frame of a run cycle. And you could actually make your own where you 
put it in a little cylinder, cut a slit, and then if you look through the slit and spin it, um, you see the actual animation moving. So it's this really magical thing. But the one previously that looks like an eyeglasses commercial to me, I don't know, maybe it is, but I don't understand, like, I don't understand the, um, the reasoning for why she's, she's there, you know, moving like that. And maybe I don't need to, maybe that's, who cares, but that's just my take on it. I also think Duchamp definitely contributed here. How do you think that happened, Alex? Yeah, I think it's, again, just conveying the challenge of conveying movement in a two-dimensional non-moving image. There are only so many answers to that question. Um, and it's really interesting to see this one by Duchamp of such a stylish, you can point this one out of a crowd, you know, and conveying this very, at times, overdone method of conveying movement with the voice of the personal style, I think can do leaps and bounds for working with cliches. Also, it's the dance thing. <laughs> it's, it's always a dancer or some ballet, ballerina. I mean, sometimes it's an athlete, it's always that. Sometimes once in a while it's something else, but I think you can see the temptation to wanna to apply this to every image of an athlete or ballet dancer that's out there. Okay, guys, this is the one that I cannot stand. This, this drives me insane. So I here's the thing. I that for every single one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just some of these drive me up the wall because this one especially, we're gonna show you guys a lot of examples. And every example is from a different artist, but honestly, they all could have been done by the same person, in my opinion. You guys can disagree with me. But I think this one, really goes to Andy Goldsworthy. I mean, he did this and then everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And I really like Andy Goldsworthy's work. And I think his work is different than the other artists we're gonna show you. I mean, do you agree or disagree, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing, there's a great documentary about uh, Andy Goldsworthy's work and, and it's amazing. If none of you have seen it, you should definitely check it out. And it's beautiful and he's such an amazing, artist and soul. Um, and it's also really easy to watch it and then make nothing but Andy Goldsworthy's work for like a week, <laughs> just because it's so captivating. Madeline says, our elementary art teacher made us do one of these and I hated it. <laughs> yes, this is an extremely common project that's going around, especially now with the pandemic, because people don't have access to a lot of sculpture supplies a lot easier to tell people to go outside and make something, but it's not limited to nature. It's everything. It's pigments, it's pieces of fiber, people who make pies. I mean, it's everywhere. And I, I don't get it. Like, is this just an eye candy thing? Deep D, what do you think? Leave the pie maker alone. Um, I don't know. I think like I think there is inevitably some effort put into it, like sourcing all of these objects and laying them out and figuring out what goes with what. And I think there's some pride maybe in that effort. But yes, of course it's eye candy. I think it also reverts us back to maybe like a childhood mentality of like, you know, building blocks. It reminds me a lot about like crayons and build like simple shapes and simple colors being grouped together. But some of these I personally kind of like, I don't know, I, I, I'm i into them. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think that these are really cool and I kind of want to organize like my desk supplies <laughs> and my paints like this because <laughs> it's so soothing. Um, I, I yeah, guess I'm okay. in the minority here because <laughs> these drive me up the wall. <laughs> Well, it's so Howling so says, I think it's the satisfaction of when it's complete that keeps people doing it. I mean, I wonder if it's sort of like knitting, like something that's slow and repetitive and you end up with something better satisfying when you're done. But anyway, this is a stream. About, sorry, it also just makes you think about like relationships and objects that maybe you wouldn't consider being grouped together like you know all of these white erasers and the green erasers perhaps you wouldn't see them as being part of the same family like the green and the white or like it, it reimagines how you group things or how you relate things which could be a cool way of thinking i don't know i'm kind of into this one 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, see, I mean, I think that proves a point that not everybody's going to agree on what is a cliche. So that's where you have to do your research because some of you guys might, and I don't see the cliche, but it's more just an awareness to know that, oh, well, some people might see it as a cliche, even though these other people happen to enjoy it as an image. So this is a somewhat related stream because we talk a lot about common mistakes people make for art school portfolios. So you guys might want to check that out. And we have an art prof share today, which is basically where one of you guys creates an artwork in response to one of our videos. So the art prof share today is a digital collage by Aimee Tan. And they are saying in the statement that this was a response to the video on shapes that is part of our Elements of Art series that Deep D and I did a little ways back. And so this is an image of a marshmallow melting from its square shape to its organic gooey form, and then changing its shape, the mushroom's angular shifts and moves downwards. It's a really fun piece. Alex, what's your take on this? And this is an in-progress image, and then this is the final. What do you think, Alex? My two favorite things are first the color. I love the exciting color of the marshmallow and the world therein, and the repetitive shape of the square rectangle form is really kind of soothing for the eye. And it's cool seeing them in different forms, different sizes, and really making the image with that minimal toolbox, as they say. Deepti, how do you think Aimee did with shape? I think this is great. I love the exploration of curves and rigid ed- rigid edges and also the progression of time. Um, I think this is a really cool way of showing progression of time because there's actually a material changing its form throughout and that has to do with shape. So it all comes back to the original intent of you creating the piece. So that's you know, ties in well to what we were just talking about, which is really cool. But I really love the texture you're working with. And clearly it looks like you had a lot of fun making this and it looks like you explored a lot of fun things. So um, I think it's awesome. And I love that you made this and I love that you watched our tutorial and were inspired. I just have to call out this comment. W315 says marshmallow descending a staircase. (laughs) Wow, that's quite a coincidence because it is somewhat related in terms of the movement. I'll tell you guys, though, the part of the composition that I really appreciate that I think is not as noticeable right away is actually that big rectangle in the background, the one that's behind the steps, because I'm sort of imagining, okay, what if that big rectangle wasn't there? I almost feel like the background would be too bright and that maybe the marshmallow wouldn't pop out so much. So I'm always looking for those areas that are sort of underappreciated because the marshmallow is the main event. I mean, that's the part that we're really seduced by and looking at. But I think, I mean, you do a really nice job of balancing all of these different parts together. So if you guys create artwork in response to one of our videos, you should go to tutorials on artprof.org and you will see a purple button where you guys can get access to the Artprof Share submission form because we love seeing what you guys make. And remember, if you just want to show us on Instagram, just tag us and use hashtag artprofshare. We'd like to share these and our stories as much as possible. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Deep D and I will be in the Art Prof Discord in the post live streams channel. Alex is going to crash because he's been camping. So <laughs> we're going to let him go this one time, but you guys will get some Alex time later on. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And I want to say thank you to our top Patreon supporters who make it possible to keep ArtProf 100% free and accessible to everybody. So thank you so much. And also to all of you guys who listened, contributed to the discussion. We so appreciate that. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye.